Our sermon tonight is from 2 Kings 22 and 2 Chronicles 34. Actually, the last week when we were doing Joshua's, uh, Josiah, uh, for some reason we had 2 Chronicles 36 or something like that. I don't know how the chapter was off on that, but nonetheless, it's chapter 34 this week. Uh, Josiah part 3, the found book. Okay, so for Josiah, we're way down here in the timeline from King David after northern Israel has been taken captive. In the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, he sent, talking about Josiah, he sent Sephathan, the son of Azaliah, governor of the, and the governor of the city, and Jonah, the son of whoever, and the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. Right? And so that's just review. So he, uh, one of the first things that he did as, as king, we saw he gave his heart to the Lord and began to seek the Lord his God uh, in his eighth year. And then his 18th year of his reign, he begins uh, cleaning out the temple and reestablishing it and repairing the temple of the Lord for worship. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Helachai the Kohen found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Helachai gave it to the scribe Zephan. Now this is interesting. I'm, uh, it says that he found the book of the law given by Moses. So whether it was the original script, the original handwritten handwriting of Moses, or a copy, uh, we don't know. But it's obviously significant that he found it and he excited about it, and so he gives it to the scribe to bring to the king. So they must not have had a copy. This is an 18th year, and he doesn't have a copy of it for whatever reason. Uh, it hasn't been reading it again. Uh, through the time of Manasseh and the and the uh, and Amnon, Manasseh's son, uh, Josiah's father, there was you know no searching of the word of God, no following the word of God until Manasseh's end of his life, and so now they find the book of the law, and when Sephan came to the king saying, "All that was committed to your servants, they are doing. The money that was found in the house of the Lord has been given to the overseers and the workmen." And Helikiah the Kohen has given me a book. And Zephan read it before the king. So it's kind of like as a side note. He says, okay, we're doing all the work you told us to do, and everything's going real good, and uh, the money's being spent just as you commanded it, and, and it's all good. And look, we got this book. We found this book there. And he begins to read him the book. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothing. And so he's reading through the Torah. He's reading through... Uh, Genesis, no doubt, Rashid, and reading through the stories of, of uh, Genesis, of, of, of creation, and of Adam and Eve, and Noah, and Abraham, and Joseph. And he's reading through the stories and comes to the Exodus, and Moses, and the laws. And who knows at what point he begins to rip his clothes. At what point was it that convicted him that something was wrong in the land? Leviticus. And how long would it take to get that far? You know, but he then rips his clothing. So they could have been reading for days or who knows how long, but he's reading the law, he's reading the word, he's reading the Torah to him, and he gets convicted in his heart and his soul. This is just evidence of what he had already done in seeking the Lord his God, in seeking to know his will, that his heart was sensitive to God. I remember when I first started reading the Bible, I, I began reading it to, my mom had come to the Lord, accepted the Messiah, and, uh, and so I began reading the Bible to prove her wrong regarding the Messiah. And so I wasn't reading it for spiritual reasons, I was reading it for just to help her, and so I was reading it like a textbook, looking for the text that says that Yeshua is not the Messiah, and then I can go back to my life, and she can go back to her life, and everything would be normal again. And, and so... You know, I was just reading through it, but it began to convict me and cut my heart. And I fell in love with God and fell in love with God's Word. And of course, as I kept on reading and reading and reading and reading and never found anything that uh, disproved what she was uh, saying regarding the Messiah. And so thus I eventually accepted the Messiah. Barbara began reading the Word of God. A friend at work gave it to her. And she had never read it before, and she began reading it. And when she got into uh, Deuteronomy, right, uh, she felt convicted as she was reading about how the Israelites would, would uh, 
disobey the word of God and, and worship the golden calf and other times uh, fell back and, and, and she began to pray and pray to the Lord. Lord, is that my, like my life? Have I been not following you and following you and then turning back? And has my life been inconsistent like that as well? When we read God's word, it convicts and cuts to the chase, cuts to the heart, if we're open and receptive to it. After I read the word of God, I, 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 I started to tell everybody, you got to read this book. <laughs> like, Elika, go share this with the king. you got to read this book. It's amazing. And I, so I would get copies and pass them out to people. And I came across a, a friend that I, that I, I, I knew uh, from high school. And I told him, you've got to read the Bible. And he said, I already read it. Now, I knew from his life that it didn't have any impact on him at all. <laughs> so we can read it without a spiritual understanding. Now, I should back up and say, when I started reading it again, I began reading it like a textbook or a newspaper, trying to find again where she's missing the... But she told me, my mom told me, well, if you're going to read God's word, you have to pray before you read. And I think that made the difference. Where I don't think my friend prayed at all. He was just <laughs> reading it to get through it for whatever reason. Um, but I began to pray and read God's word. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so when Josiah is hearing the word of God, since he had already began to seek the Lord as God and had a desire to do his will, and when he read God's word, it convicted him. And the closer we come to God and the more we read God's word, the more it will convict us. He's already been walking with the Lord and doing lots of righteous things. He's repairing the temple. He's seeking the Lord. He's reinstated the sacrifices. He's gone throughout the land, including to the north, Israel, which was no longer under Judah's realm. But he went there anyway to cleanse that land as well. He's doing godly things. God's moving upon his heart. Now he's in his 18th year, and the word of God is still conviction, bringing conviction to him. It's the closer we get to God, the more we are convicted. Not the opposite. Some people, even people who don't believe in God, seem to think that we, the godly people think we're so righteous and that we're so good and that we're better than them. But in reality, the closer we get to God, the worse we realize we are. Not that we're thinking we're better than anyone, That's right. but we see ourselves in our true relation to God instead of just in comparison to ourselves or in comparison to others. Rabbi Paul said, if we compare ourselves with ourselves, and if we compare ourselves with others, we're not wise. Because that's a deadly trap. Once we start doing that, then we'll think we're better than some, and we'll think we're worse than others. We'll just be a yo-yo all over the place. Insecure all over the place, or proud all over the place. But when we look at ourselves in relation to God, we see where we really stand in our great need of him and how much further he wants to take us and bring us in his transformation in our lives. And that's what happens to Josiah. They begin, he's walking with the Lord all these years, and yet when the word of God is read to him, he's convicted. And again, when we get to heaven, I'm going to ask him what part was the, where he really you know, felt that conviction that he just broke down and said, that's enough, I can't take it anymore, and ripped his clothes. And so the king commanded Helikiah and inquire of the Lord for me and for those left in Israel and Judah. So again, he's still including the northern tribes that Assyria has come and taken most of them captive. And he's still concerned for them. So inquire for me of the Lord for those left in Israel as well as all of Judea concerning the words of the book. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do all that is written in this book. So he's gotten no doubt to the commandments. He's gotten no doubt to, to uh, the curses and the blessings. And he's convicted at heart. So go seek the Lord and let's find out what's going to happen. And so Helikiah and those the king had appointed went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shulam, the son of Tolkiah, the son of Hazriah, keeper of the wardrobe. And she dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her. I thought this was interesting. So they mention her, Huldah, and that she's a prophetess, 
And then they go on about her husband and who he's the son of and who he's the grandson of. Well, who cares about him? He's not a prophet or a prophetess or nothing. You know, he's just a, you know, the keeper of the wardrobe. <laughs> but they go on and on and on about him and, and just to mention her, Hulda, that she's his wife. And she's the important one in the family. So just kind of how it was, you know, the thinking back then. But she's the one whom God speaks to. And she's the one that they go to. They don't go to the keeper of the wardrobe. They don't go and ask him anything. <laughs> They know she's the one who has the connection with God at this point in time. And so they go to her, to Hulda, but still even the writer still just can't just put Hulda the prophetess. <laughs> he has to mention who she's married to and what his standing is. So they dwell in Jerusalem and they speak with her and ask her what the Lord's will is. And since she's a prophetess, she communicates with God and she said, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants, all the curses written in the book, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. And my wrath will be poured out on this place and not be quenched. So heavy prophecy, very plain, very clear. That's why a lot of people don't go to prophetesses. <laughs> why a lot of people don't want to hear the word of God. That's why the people, a lot of people don't want to open the word of God. They don't want to be convicted. Right? Yeah, Cheryl told me that she was, in her testimony, she was uh, quoting about God, and telling people about God at work, and, and one person addressed her and said, that sounds like the book of Cheryl to me. <laughs> and she got convicted. Because that's all she was talking about. She hadn't read the word of God yet. But she was just expounding from what she thought she knew about her vision of God, of her picture of God, of her opinion of God, without really knowing God. We need to go and find out what God says about God. Amen. And it will convict our heart. And find out from the word of God. Even if it pronounces curses upon us because of the way we're living. Even if it tells us what we're doing is wrong. Better to know the word of God than just our own opinion on things. But to the king, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you. So what's different between Josiah and the others that are, the curse is pronounced against? What's different between Josiah and you and me? What's different between Josiah and anyone else on this earth? What was it that made his heart tender? What was it that made him humble himself before God? What was it that caused him to tear his clothes and weep before God? The word of the Lord convicted him. The word of the Lord convicted him. So why did it convict him and why didn't it convict my friend from high school? Why does it convict some and not others? Is it how Josiah was born? Was it because of his father? Was it because of his grandfather? What was it about Josiah? Was it his DNA? Was it just how he was meant to be? Was it just fate? Or was, did God just predestine him for this purpose? Was he different than others that he received the word of God with tenderness of heart and humility of soul? Or was it a choice that he made that made the difference? I believe it was the choice he made. Nothing special about him, nothing special about anyone that makes him any different, no different about Hulda than Josiah, than Moses, than David, than Abraham, than anyone else. God's love for all of us is there for all the world. And his conviction will come to everyone who chooses to receive it, to receive it and to humble themselves, right? 
You humbled yourself. That's a choice we get to make. That is something that we can do. We can choose to resist or we can choose to surrender. The choice is ours. The power of choice that God has given to us is amazing. It is so amazing, the power of choice that we have, that God has given to us, it makes us more powerful than God himself. Because it's God's will that we all will be saved. But he has given us the ability to resist his will. He's given us the power to resist and change his desire. His desire is for each of us to be in heaven. And he's given us the power to say no to him. That's a powerful choice. It's a wrong choice. But God in his great love for us has given us the ability to reject him or to receive him. And we each have that choice. It is my prayer that we receive that choice tonight. That we choose to humble ourselves before him. That we choose to open up his word and allow it to convict us. To choose to read even the portions that tell us that we're doing wrong. To choose to read the whole scriptures, all of it. Not just the promises, but the warnings and the curses and the laws and allow it to convict our hearts and soul. Allow it to show us where we're wrong and where God wants us to be. And because Josiah made that choice, chose to humble his heart and his soul and to hear the word of the Lord, surely I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. So a wonderful promise from the Lord through Huldah to Josiah. That he's not going to have to, because he humbled himself, God is promising him he will rest in peace. He will die in peace. He won't see the calamities that's going to take place upon Jerusalem and its inhabitants. Now, a similar message was given to uh, Josiah's great-grandfather, uh, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah responded, whew, good, not going to happen to me. <laughs> Tough luck on everybody else. Won't happen in my day. It'll happen to my kids and grandkids, but hey, that's their problem. But it's not going to happen to me. So how did Josiah respond to this message? The king gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the Kohanim and the Levites and all the people, great and small, and he read in the hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. He wants to bring conviction to them. God changed my heart, he's saying, thinking, and God can change their heart as well. And so he does, again like I did, go around and tell everybody, you've got to read the word of the Lord you got to read this book. It's powerful. It's wonderful. Changed my life like the woman at the well. Come and meet a man who's told me everything about myself. Come and meet him. He's the Messiah. Come and meet him. Let him change your life. And so he gathers everyone together and begins reading the word of the Lord to them. Now he's the king, and so they listen. So they all come <laughs> because he's the king. He begins to read the word of the Lord to them. He hasn't given up on him. He doesn't say, well, Hulda said, God said that, you know, they're lost and tough luck on them, calamity's coming to them. He begins working for their salvation as well. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the Lord of the covenant that were written in this book. And so then the king does what he's already done privately. He now does publicly as a demonstration, as a witness, and as an example to everyone else. He covenants, promises, and dedicates himself to the Lord. For God to change his life, take out his resistant heart, give him a 
obedient heart and for God to keep him through the Holy Spirit, through the Ruach of God, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit to empower him to keep his commandments, his testimonies, his statutes with all his heart, with all his soul. He covenants to follow God publicly with, in front of everyone. And he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. So the people follow suit. The people do it as well. But the key word there is why do they do it? He made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to take a stand. So he does it by kingly authority. He's so concerned for them. He doesn't want any to be lost. And so he makes a command. And he makes them do it. And so they do it. Thus Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. So all his days, not all their days, he made them do it and they were obedient as long as he was alive. All of his days they followed suit because he made them. He was the king and so he commanded it. Now, that's not the end of the story, and we won't cover the rest of the story tonight. And there's more about Josiah, and there's more about the people who continue to live on after him, which we'll cover in following weeks. But we cannot legislate morality. Oh, we can change behavior. We can modify people's behavior. But we can't change the heart. That is only something that the person can choose to allow God to do. It's God who does it, but it's our choice that allows him to do it. And Josiah does what he can in reading the word of the Lord to them and demonstrating it in his own life and covenanting before them, but the choice is still theirs. So Josiah goes about doing whatever he can to avert the disaster that's been proclaimed against the people and the nation. He didn't just say, well, hey, I've got a promise that I'm going to be fine all my life and I'm going to rest in peace. He's still concerned for the nation and for the northern kingdom, Israel as well. He's concerned for the people. And we should have that burden as well. We shouldn't just sit back and say, well, I've given my heart to the Lord and I've got the promises of God. I have the assurance of salvation. And tough luck on all the rest of these nations. Tough luck on all the rest of the people in this city. And of course, we wouldn't say that. But what does our life say? What does our attitude say? What do our actions tell? What do we really think about everybody else in the world? Are we just content with our own salvation? Are we content with our own promise that it's going to be well with us and we're going to rest in peace? Are our prayers just for ourselves? Are our prayers just to keep our car running and our house safe and and our health good? Is our prayer just for ourselves? Or are we praying for others? Are we praying for the lost? Are we reaching out to them? Are we encouraging them to read God's word? Are we bringing God's word to them in various different forms and ways? Are we sharing the love of God? Are we demonstrating in our lives? Are we covenanting before them and letting them see in our own personal lives godliness lived out? Are we laboring for the lost? That was Josiah's desire. He didn't just take the prophecy and say, well, tough luck on them. He did what he could. And if they really fully repented, if the nation as a whole and and, and many individuals repented fully and, and, and got the country going right again, even after Josiah, what do you think would happen to that prophecy of Huldah? 
I believe it would be totally different. God doesn't prophesy telling what's going to happen and dictate it that way. God prophesies because he knows what's going to happen. But it doesn't make it his will. It doesn't make it his desire. It can be changed. We see that with Nineveh. He prophesied it was going to be destroyed. They repented, and Nineveh was spared. God's mercy is still held out for those who will turn their hearts to him. And so we know the path is narrow. We know that only few will follow the Lord. We know broad is the way that leads to destruction. But that shouldn't stop us from trying to reach out to everybody we come in contact with and try and bring them to the knowledge of the Lord. Because God doesn't give up on them. And if we have God's heart, we won't give up either. And who who will we just know and and say who's ready and who's not ready? Could have written Josiah off. He was only eight years old. Came from a rotten father and rotten grandfather. But God reached him, touched his heart, and he chose to surrender to him. And then the word of God convicted him more. And so several areas could apply to us tonight. And several more than I can even think of, no doubt. But if you've been putting off reading the Word of God, if you've never read the whole entire Word of God, I encourage you tonight, when we pray, for you to make a commitment to God, personally in your own soul and mind and heart, just between you and God, that you will read the whole Word of God, that you will read through it prayerfully, and not just reading it like a textbook, but reading it for God to convict you and to cut your heart so that you want to just tear your clothes and rip your heart out in conviction. Sincerely allowing God to show you where you err and what he is calling upon you is. Or maybe you've read the Word of God, but it's been a while since you've read the full Word of God. It's something we should do daily throughout our lives. And if you've put off daily devotions of the Word of God, I want to encourage you tonight to make a decision to get back on a reading schedule of reading the Word of God. Morning, evening, daily devotionals, reading the Word of God. And again, prayerfully. Not so it can show you what other people are doing wrong, but so it can show you what you're doing wrong. So that God can, you can surrender that to God and He can give you the power to do what's right. You can surrender it to the Messiah, accept his forgiveness, accept his cleansing, accept his redemption, and accept his power to change the areas in our life that are wrong. Or if in your own life you've received the power of God, you received the covenant of God, you received the promises of God, and you've received his salvation, and you've just been thankful with that. And you haven't really been that concerned about the curses that are pronounced upon this world and the destruction that is coming upon this world. And you want to ask God to give you his heart, to take you to that next level in salvation with him, to have a burdened desire in your soul for the lost. And then for God to give you the gifts and talents and the abilities and open doors for you to be able to share his love and his truth with those that don't know it. If that's part of your life, then when we pray, ask God to give you a conviction and a, and a burden for the lost and for open doors to share the word of God with those who need it. So if any of those areas apply to you tonight as we pray, surrender to God and let him work in you and through you. Or maybe there's some other area that God's been speaking to your heart. Maybe you've been obeying God just because you were commanded at one time to do so. Maybe you were just trained to do so from as a child or whoever, and so you're just obeying and doing what you were taught, but it hasn't been real to you. Ask God to become real to you. Again, whatever area applies to you, or maybe something else, let's pray together. 
our Lord and our God, King of the universe. We are thankful for the godly choices of Josiah. We're thankful for his living example of godliness and sincerity and humility. Lord, we're thankful for your word. And as it reveals to us in our lives what areas we fall short, Lord, convict our hearts and minds through the power of your spirit and lead us in the way of repentance. Give us the gift of repentance to turn from this and to surrender it to you, whatever area has been lacking in our lives, whether neglecting your word or taking it for granted or just being self-satisfied with our own salvation or not truly knowing you. Lord, forgive us and cleanse us through the power of the Messiah and come and live in us through your spirit and give us your heart, a tenderness and tender heart and tender mind, tender towards you and tender towards your word, tender to the lost, with a burden and a concern for them and a love for you in Yeshua's holy name. Amen.